Well, folks, good morning. Good morning. A really uh, warm welcome here to Birkhead Free Church. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm uh, the minister here, uh, if we've not met. And a special welcome if you're here uh, for the first time. Uh, maybe you're on holiday or you've come with a friend. It's great to have you with us. If you have a white sheet, uh, that will guide you through our, our time together, our service together. You'll see all that we're going to do. Uh, and um, if you are new, um, we'd love it if you'd pick up a welcome pack. You'll find some of those at the ends of the rows. Um, also, please do stay for coffee at the end. And uh, you can also connect with us online, various QR codes you can scan in your service sheet. That'll help you to get to know us better as a church family, who we are and what we're about. Uh, what we're about, though, this morning is um, the worship and praise of God. Um, that's why we're here. We come to speak to him in song, in praise, and in prayer, and to hear him speak to us through his word, the Bible. And uh, so to call us to do that, to worship God, to hear his word. Listen to these words from Psalm 93. We're actually going to sing these words uh, later in our service. Here's what the psalmist says about God. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established and secure. And it goes on. The seas, O Lord, have lifted up. The seas have lifted up their voice. Mightier than the thunder of great waters. The Lord on high is mighty. And the psalmist ends by saying, Your statutes, that is your word, Lord, stand firm. And holiness adorns your house. That's the God we come to praise, the God of power and might and glory, the God who speaks in his word. And you'll see from your screens and from the sheet, we're going to begin in song, Behold our God, who has held the oceans in his hand. So if you're able to stand, let's stand as we sing.
set. Fantastic. It's great to have all the boys and girls with us as well. And um, a little bit later in our service, you're going to be heading out to your Sunday school groups. Uh, but we always have a we thought for the boys and girls. And um, if you've been here the last few weeks, well, boys and girls, let me ask you, what have we been thinking about for the last three weeks? It was a kind of journey. That's your clue. What sort of journey, Alex? unexpected journeys. So we've been meeting different characters in the Bible who went on journeys that they did not expect, but God was at work in strange ways sometimes in all of that. Now here's today's character, and I have conveniently placed the writing over the most important part of the image, making it virtually impossible for you to to, to discern who this is. But uh, any guesses, kids? Here's a character in the Old Testament, something to do with fire. Ruth? It is Elijah. Well done. Very good. Now, there's lots we could say about the life of Elijah. He was a prophet, wasn't he? So he's someone who brought God's word to the people. In fact, a lot of the time he brought God's word, not just to anyone, but to the king. And uh, the king at this particular time was not a good king. His name was King Ahab. He'd married someone called Jezebel. And, well, she was into worshipping other gods. False gods, fake gods, who were not the real God. And she encouraged Ahab and all the people to do the same. And this was not good. And so time and again, God sent Elijah with a word to the king to say, what you're doing is wrong. And the king got so fed up of Elijah saying this. Do you know what he called him? He called him trouble. He said, oh, hello, the troubler of Israel. That's what he said. Now, I bet your parents have never called you trouble. Anyway, one day, this all came to a head. And you know the story, don't you? On the mountain called Carmel, there was a face-off set up, a contest. And on one side, you had uh, the prophets of Baal. That was the fake god, the false god. And they set up their sacrifice. And um, on the other side was just Elijah. And he set up a sacrifice to the Lord. And um, the prophets of Baal danced around and sang songs and even cut themselves, did all sorts of strange things. But did their sacrifice burn up? No. Because their gods were fake gods, false gods. Elijah, on the other hand, he chucked a whole bunch of water on his just to make it even harder. And did the sacrifice come alight? It did. Because God's the real God. And um, just after that, they, they, they chased away the prophets of Baal and killed them all. Now, do you think Jezebel was very happy about this? Not at all. And so she said, I'm coming after you, Elijah. I'm going to kill you. And you know, Elijah, who'd been so brave and so bold, and he'd stood alone against the prophets of Baal, and he'd done the sacrifice and chucked the water on and been really strong and and trusted God, suddenly Elijah felt pretty scared himself. And so do you know what his unexpected journey was? Running away. He ran away down to the south of the country, a long, long way away. And God met him there. And do you know what God did? God gave him something. Do you know what it was? There's Elijah. He feels really down, really scared. And he thinks he's the only one who who trusts God and follows him anymore. Do you know what God gave him? Spiritual advice? Actually, he gave him a good night's sleep. And a good meal. And then another night's sleep. And then another good meal, which just goes to show you those things are pretty important. And then Elijah went even further away, further down south, and God met him again. And Elijah said, I feel like I'm the only one who trusts you and follows you, God. I feel so alone. And boys and girls, I tell you this story partly because you're about to go back to school, many of you, on Tuesday. And I reckon that might be true for some of you. You might feel like I'm the only one who knows God, trusts God, follows God. You might feel a bit lonely maybe even a bit afraid, like Elijah. But God meets us and helps us 
and gives us what we need. And in fact, he said to Elijah, you think you're alone, but actually you're not. First of all, I want you to go and raise up a co-worker, Elisha, confusingly named. And also God said, there are actually 7,000 people left in Israel who still worship God. So boys and girls, there's another unexpected journey. Sometimes we maybe run away because we're afraid or we feel alone, but we can learn from Elijah. God provided what he needed, even if that was just a good sleep and a hot meal. And God told him, actually, you're not alone. There are more people than perhaps you think out there who follow Jesus. Fantastic. Well, in a moment, you're going to head to your Sunday school groups, but you're going to stay where you are for a bit longer because we've got various bits of uh, exciting church family news that we want to share with you. And since we're a family, we're going to share it with uh, all generations of the family. Let me first of all just mention that you've got a a church family news sheet inside. Uh, I've got lots to say today, so please just go away uh, and take that with you and and read it. Um, Let me just say again, thanks to all of you uh, who came uh, to support uh, Donald and the Tolmy family uh, following the, the sad uh, passing away of Kathy, Donald's wife. Please keep that, the family, in, in prayer uh, this week. Uh, let me say as well, thanks to those who came and helped with the coffee morning yesterday. It's great to have so many people from the community through the doors and a chance to meet them. Uh, it raised a bunch of money as well, I think 400 and something pounds, maybe heading on towards 500 uh, which the ladies will, will distribute to various uh, charitable causes. Uh, so thanks for that. Thanks to everyone who helped uh, as well to make that possible. Um, the one thing from this week I want to mention is Wednesday. We have got our annual church meeting. And uh, no one feels full of joy when they hear those words. But you should. Uh, this is a chance to hear about all God's doing amongst us as a church Uh, to ask questions, to pray, please come. You don't need to be a formal member in in, in the formal sense. Please, if you're you're part of our church family in any way, join us on Wednesday. And um, here's the bonus, okay? I like to offer a bonus. Um, On the 28th of August, we're going to be sharing with the whole church family um, our plans to redevelop the church halls. We've got a video, we've got a website, we've got a leaflet. We've even got a 3D model to show you. Thanks, Keith, our architect. Uh, But if you come on Wednesday, you're going to get a sneak preview of all of that. So I can't say fairer than that. Join us on Wednesday if you can. I'm going to hand over now to Rachel, I think, uh, who's going to bring us uh, an update on Roddy McLeod, one of our mission partners uh, who works with soldiers and airmen sharing the gospel. So, Rachel, over to you. So the Forest Small Group has been linked with SASRA um, with a particular focus on Roddy McLeod at Fort George and Kinloss. And Roddy's asked us to share a few prayer points with you all. So SASRA is going through significant uh, changes at the moment with their executive director moving on, having been called to a church as their minister. So prayers for this transition period um, are much needed. Um, Summer leave will be coming to an end um, in the next week or so. Um, So we think of those starting back and um, we pray to God for many divine appointments with those whose hearts are ready to hear the good news of Jesus. Um, And there's also, um, from Roddy, there's been worrying content in Roddy's son's school curriculum. Um, So there's much prayer needed for wisdom in how to handle the situation and how they address those issues. Um, Please do, as always, look at the board at the back of the church, um, and we've got some bookmarks that you can take away um, that have got the prayer points on them. And finally, um, folk are very welcome to join us at our small group and can speak to any of our group or Peter if you'd like any more information um, about the work of SASRA. Thank you. Brilliant, Rachel. Thanks so much. Bookmarks, great preparation. Take those away. Up next, we're going to hear from Davi de Paola. Davi is our minister in training. Uh, He and Emma have just, I'm not going to steal your thunder here, but he and Emma have just been away to help lead on a free church camp. He's going to tell us briefly about that, and you boys and girls might be interested to hear, because you could go when you're a little bit older as well to this kind of thing. Thanks to the church family. Again, uh, you you gave, I think, something like £255 towards uh, funding Davy and Emma to go, uh, and the finance committee here uh, happily funded the rest as well to send them. So, Davy, tell us about the camp. What was good? What happened? Over to you. Well, I think we're going to get some pictures up on the board, on the board, on the screen. 
if you press next, uh, that will give you a little sense of what happened during the camp. But the first thing to say is just a massive, massive thank you on behalf of all the camp leaders, on behalf of MNI, and also the campers as well. A massive thank you to all of you who prayed for us, who gave financially so that we could run this year's um, Free Church Oswestry Senior Camp 1. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, down in sunny Shropshire in England. It was a really wonderful, wonderful time. Your prayers and your gifts, they ensured a really successful week. We did so many fun things. We went to an inflatables place. We went to axe throwing. We went to go-karting. We did a trip to Alton Towers for some roller coaster action. It was amazing, excellent fun. All uh, during, I think, the, well, the, the week before the sunniest week we've ever had in our country. So we enjoyed no, not having any heat stroke or anything like that, but we enjoyed the sunshine. It was excellent. During our evening sessions, um, we looked and went through the whole book of Ecclesiastes. In our discussion groups afterwards, uh, the teens were really grasping with the reality of life under the sun and the good God who provides it. Lots of questions were asked, lots of thinking was happening, lots of pondering was happening. And at such a formative time in the lives of these young people, we pray and we hope that that was a really um, good time, a worthwhile time spent in God's word, and it was helpful for them. We were really glad, we were privileged to, to share the word of God with these guys. And ultimately, we ask you to continue to pray for the youth of our church. Many of them, even in this camp, um, were not yet believers, though they would never admit that to their parents. Pray that they would know Jesus as their Lord. There were lots of guys in the camp who were strong and faithful Christians who knew Jesus as their Savior. Keep on praying for them. Being a Christian in high school and university is not easy nowadays. Pray the Lord will strengthen them. And we hope that this week that we've got to spend together having fun, obviously, making friendships, but also looking at God's word closely and spending good time in it. We pray that that will be a real boost to the commitment of some to the Lord their Jesus and perhaps a good opportunity for some to question and consider where they lie in their relationship with the Lord. So we pray on for these young guys and we are thankful and we are blessed by you and that we got to do this camp and we look forward to doing it all again next year. Thank you. Fantastic, Davy. Thank you so much. We don't normally have this much news, but it's great to be able to share it with you all. Uh, a little something from me as well. Um, if you're new, you, you might not know, but this is um, uh, the beginning for us of a series of Vision Sundays. We're thinking about who we are as a church um, and where we are heading. Uh, so a few words on Vision 2030, which is not a typo, um, as we start. Uh, most of you know in the last seven years, by his grace, God has given us uh, growth in this church family. Uh, some have come to faith for the first time. Many others are back to church. Some have joined us as they've uh, moved to the region. Our building has been refurbished more importantly, the life of our congregation has been renewed. We have been working towards our current vision, which is, as you know, to grow, to be a vibrant, all-age church of 100 disciples. That's Burghead. We're going to think for a moment, though, about our neighbors in Elgin Free Church. Um, again, many will know, but uh, next spring, uh, Colin Morrison will retire as the minister of that church uh, after more than 20 years of faithful ministry. Sadly, the Elgin congregation is not in a, a position financially to be able to call and sustain a new minister. There are some wonderful people uh, in that congregation, um, but they are small in number and there is a need and an opportunity for fresh life. And because of this, as many of you know, know with the, the encouragement of our presbytery and the wider denomination, in the spring of next year, uh, Burghead Free Church, that's us, will be linked with uh, Elgin Free Church. I will become the minister overseeing both congregations. And together, our task will be the ongoing revitalization of this church family and, God willing, a new work of church revitalization in Elgin, and then 
as many know, if the Lord blesses that work, our hope is, um, in line with our denomination's vision to plant 30 new churches by 2030, our hope is that uh, we will plant a third congregation uh, in the town of Forest. We've been calling this process two become one to become three. So the two, that's ourselves, and Elgin become one. We're linked together in order that through church revitalization here and in Elgin and through church planting in forests, we will eventually become those three congregations. Now, in our work here in Burkhead, um, as many will know, it's been helpful to us uh, to have mission and vision statements. This is what we're all about. Mission is the reason we exist. And then vision is about the future. Where, where are we heading, God willing? What are we aiming at? And I want to let you know today that, that uh, because of the linkage with our friends in Elgin, um, our elders uh, met a few weeks ago and we discussed renewing our mission and vision statements. And we hope they'll help us as we go through this process so from now on and I'm gonna to have to get a new banner but from now on um, our mission will be knowing Jesus and making Jesus known to the glory of his name now there are two reasons for that firstly the, the glory of his name bit is pretty much lifted from the Elgin mission statement um, but secondly at a time when we are expanding the scope of what we do um, from one location to potentially three, we think it's more important than ever for us to remember that we are about building God's kingdom for his glory, not our empire for our glory. So our mission, knowing Jesus, making Jesus known to the glory of his name. And then vision, are you ready for this? In some ways it's not changed, in some ways it's changed a lot. Our vision is this, to grow, to become three vibrant all age churches, each of 100 disciples. That's virtually identical, except, of course, three times the size. Now, in a week or two, you're going to get some new vision cards. You can take the old ones down off the fridge, and you can stick the new ones on, which will have this information. So every time you go to get the milk out, again, you can pray uh, for that. So more about Vision 2030 in our sermon today. But for now, there are our refreshed mission and vision statements. We're knowing Jesus and making Jesus known to the glory of his name. And how do we see the future? Well, God willing, we want to grow to become three vibrant all-age churches, each of 100 disciples. Boys and girls, you listen so well. And so do the big boys and girls as well. Shall I pray for the kids? And then you are going to head off to your Sunday school group. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you uh, that in your grace to us, we are growing to become an all-age church. We pray for our children and young people, Lord, that you would bless them and teach them and help them today. And whatever our age, we pray that we might leave here uh, knowing Jesus better and ready and eager to make him known to others. In his name we ask. Amen. Fantastic. Well, here come your Sunday school leaders, uh, Heather and Fiona and Keith, and they'll lead you down to the hall and to your groups. So on you go, kids. Fantastic. Well, we are going to continue in our prayers. And uh, here comes Sue Hopkinson, one of our members, to lead us in our prayer. So over to you, Sue. Thanks. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to worship you, assured and loved, knowing your eternal and unchanging character, trusting in your wisdom, power and sovereignty, over our lives and all that happens. Thank you that you always listen to our prayers, seeking us daily to turn to you. You are the King who sent your Son to die on the cross so that we may be free from our sin, forgiven, redeemed and restored in relationship with you through the grace of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Thank you, Father. 
O oh Lord God, we repent of our self-reliance, our belief in our own actions and worldly things. Forgive us when we turn away from you, rejecting your sacrifice and great love for us, willfully ignoring that you are our rock and sure foundation. Forgive us when we sin, giving in to selfish behaviours. We are sorry. Father God, be with us in our distress. Give health to the sick, hope to the fearful, and comfort to the mourners. We remember now Donald and his family as they grieve for the loss of Cass, giving thanks for her life and her love. Draw close to those who are hurting, Lord. Only you give meaning to our lives and can grant our hearts the peace that passes all understanding. As we speak, seek to build your kingdom for your glory, Father, give us ears to listen, hearts and minds to understand your words and to obey your commands, actively giving, serving and working to bring your gospel truth to others. <coughs> Let us cherish and nurture our children in your loving ways. As our young people and staff return to school or college, Facing new starts and challenges, help them to understand that you are the sure foundation of truth and purpose in their lives. Help them to stand strong, trusting, obeying and leaning on you, building and leading lives that point to you. Protect them from careless thoughts, words and actions. As we reopen youth work in Youth Club and Pathfinders, Build and equip our teams to serve you tirelessly, opening these young minds and hearts to your word and love for them. Loving Father God, let your word lead us. Strengthen our wills. Convince us to be servant-hearted as we build your church here in Burkhead and Elgin and Forest. We pray that your kingdom will come. We ask this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sue, so much. And uh, as part of our Vision 2030 series, we are going to be journeying over the next five weeks through the book of Nehemiah. And we start that today. And so we're going to read, or Lindsay, I think, is going to come and read for us uh, from Nehemiah chapter 1. It is on the screen, uh, but even better, why don't you find page 484 in the church Bibles. Thanks, Lindsay. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kinslev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from, from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. 
Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. I was cut bearer to the king. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Lindsay, for reading for us. If you have opened that in your Bible, well done. Keep it open. We're coming back to it in just a moment. But for now, we're going to sing once again the words of that psalm we read together at the beginning. They speak of God as a God of might and of power. Uh, uh, who makes promises and keeps them in his word. Emma's going to lead us. Let's stand as we sing. The Lord is king, his throne endures, majestic in his height. The Please do sit. Thank you, Emma, for leading us. And we're going to come back now to uh, that first chapter of Nehemiah. You'll see a little blue sheet tucked inside your service sheet. Um, You might like to dig that out. It will guide you through where we're going. Uh, Some people like to take notes as well. Please use it for that uh, if you'd like to. And um, let me say as well, over the next five weeks, um, you're going to get various... uh, bits of paper, I suppose, including these, these sermon notes on our series from Nehemiah and other things about our vision, about the the refurbishment works to the hall. And um, if you'd like to keep those together, I think that might be quite good. Um, We're we're heading off on a journey together as a church and um, taking notes, keeping them to refer to them might be helpful. If you'd like to do that, there are some little plastic wallets, A5 ones at the back. You could grab one of them. You could put stuff in week by week. I'd like to think I'm the sort of organized person who would do that. Maybe you are, uh, and that might be a help. Anyway, whether you want to do that or not, let's pray for God's help as we come to his word. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who has spoken to us. Shine the light of the gospel of Jesus into the darkness of our lives and saved us and set us on a new course as your servants Father, we pray that you would speak to us today about who we are in Christ and the mission you have sent us on. And Lord, may that be for our good, yes, but more importantly, for the glory of your name in this region. Amen. 
Well, as I said, these next five weeks, with one week's break, I think, we will be um, laying the foundations, I hope, for the life and work and ministry of our church family for the rest of the decade, probably beyond as well. And uh, look, every time we open God's word, it is important. In that respect, there are no inconsequential sermons. Um, We always hear God addressing us from his word. Uh, But I reckon these next few weeks are particularly important for our church family. Um, We are setting the direction for what I and and the elders believe that the Lord is calling us to do. Uh, But of course, what matters is not what I think or what the elders think, but what God thinks. This is his word, not mine. And so we're setting this vision by going through the book of Nehemiah. There's no time for any more preamble. Let's get straight in. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Now, you might have arrived in this book cold. You're thinking who, what, when, where, why? Well, Nehemiah is in exile. Remember, God had given his people the promised land. He promised them that if they walked with him in obedience, they would know his blessing. But instead, the people disobeyed God. And so instead of God's blessing, the promised judgment came. And ultimately, that meant that the Lord allowed the land to be invaded and overrun, cities destroyed, and his people, or most of them at least, carried off into exile in a foreign land. That exile lasted for 70 years, and so many people, including Nehemiah, were actually born in exile. Bear in mind, Nehemiah has never seen his homeland. And yet he's deeply concerned for it. And so when some folks from Jerusalem pass Susa, which is where he lives, he quizzes them about the state of things. And they reply, verse 3, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And with that, we've reached our first point on the screen and on your sheet. We need to get the facts about the cause of Christ in Murray. You say, what's this got to do with Murray? Well, nothing yet. The fact is, Nehemiah gets told the unvarnished truth about the state of things in Jerusalem. And the state of things is about as grim as it gets. Verse 3 again, there is trouble, there is disgrace, the city walls are broken down and burnt. Now you might think, well, what's so bad about that? And no one likes to see a city in ruins, but is it really that significant? Well, listen to what one Bible commentator says. The place was in ruins, but also the work of God is paralyzed and the people of God are demoralized. Furthermore, broken walls meant frightening insecurity, negligible commercial development, and serious economic deprivation. Things are really bad in Jerusalem. But it's even more significant because this is not just any city and these are not just any People At this point in the story of salvation history, God's plans for the world, God is working out his rescue plan through the nation of Israel who have been given this land and in particular the city of Jerusalem, which of course is the place of the temple. And symbolically at least, that was the place where God's presence dwelled with his people. So in other words, we're not just looking at a city in ruins because the city is tied up with the plans and purposes of God. And so it appears, at least, that the purposes of God, or what we might call the cause of Christ, lies in ruins. 
And the people of God, even those who have made it back, are thoroughly demoralized. The work of God is paralyzed. The people of God demoralized. And I just wonder if that sounds familiar to us in 21st century Scotland. As we think about our work in the cause of Christ here in Murray for the rest of the decade, I think we'd be wise to start with the same question that Nehemiah did. We need to ask questions about the cause of Christ here in Murray today. And like Nehemiah, we need to be prepared to hear the unvarnished truth about the state of the Christian faith, the cause of Christ in our nation and region today. And very sadly, the situation, just as in Nehemiah's day, is grim. Here are some stats about the situation to ground us. They come mostly from a 2016 Scottish church survey. It was the most wide-ranging church survey in this nation in recent times. Between 2002 and 2016, 10 Christian congregations closed every month across Scotland. And it's worth bearing in mind that that statistic and all the others are pre-pandemic. COVID, sadly, has, has rapidly sped up many of those closures. I was speaking to, to leaders from another denomination the other day, uh, because I'm due to be speaking at a conference for some of their members. They were telling me that a number of their congregations closed their doors in lockdown, and they simply have never been able to reopen. You might also know that things have been coming to a head in the Church of Scotland of late. Dozens, if not hundreds, of C of S congregations will close their doors in the cuts that are now coming. And to give you an idea of scale, in our own locality between Burkhead and Forest, there will be eight Church of Scotland buildings, some of which were already merged into joint parishes, but, but eight, which is planned to become just two, between Burkhead, Avis, Kinloss, Findhorn, Dallas, Rafford, and the two congregations in Forest, only one in Forest and one in Kinloss is planned to be kept. That's a draft at the minute, but as things stand, all those other congregations, including our friends across the road in the Burkhead, Burkhead Church of Scotland, are facing the planned closure of their buildings. You might ask why all these closures? Well, the fact is between 2002 and 2025, church attendance across Scotland is on course to more than half in just 25 years, from 12% down to just over 5%. And again, crucially, that forecast was made before the pandemic. And most researchers reckon that in addition to that decline, congregations have actually lost a further third of their people throughout the pandemic. Just think about that for a moment. Back in 2016, the average church leader was 57, the average age, not far off retirement. And that age will be higher today which means there's not just a crisis of membership, but of leadership. I reckon many of us have been content to put our heads in the sand about this, maybe for decades. But the evidence is all around us. We can no longer do that. And we shouldn't want to bury our heads in the sand either, because the crucial first step for Nehemiah, when it comes to building in the kingdom of God, was to know the facts and face the unvarnished truth. And we've got to do the same in our day and age. In many ways, the church in Scotland lies in ruins, just as the city of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day. Now look, there are pockets of growth. There are some examples of life amid the decline, but we cannot help but see that the dominant picture, the unvarnished truth is decline. In many ways, the church in Scotland 
and frankly in the rest of the UK and much of Western Europe lies in ruins. If you turn over your blue sheet for a moment, you'll see there's a section headed, How Should We Respond? And again, over the next five, six weeks, we're going to be highlighting ways that we as a church family should respond to all we see here, here in Nehemiah. And I'm getting you to turn that over now because since we're talking about Nehemiah surveying the scene in Jerusalem and inquiring into the state of things, I would like to ask for your help to do some of that in Elgin during the month of September. We reckon this might be an, an important step in the process of church revitalization there. We need volunteers who are willing to give some time, maybe a few afternoons or a few evenings, at a time of your convenience during September to do some door knocking in Elgin and to ask residents to complete a short, simple survey. Three or four questions, things like, have you ever been to church? Would you be willing to go if invited? If so, what time on a Sunday should a church meet? What does the city of Elgin need most? Three or four simple questions, that sort of thing. This will get us working with our brothers and sisters in Elgin. It will help them and perhaps us to begin to look outward to the city around. It will bring us interactions with people who don't yet know the Lord. And it might just get us some interesting data. If we had 10 volunteers from Burghead to help the folks in Elgin to do this, that would be a massive help. Could you do that? If you could, let me know. I'm going to put a sign-up sheet at the back and you can get involved. Anyway, Nehemiah surveys the scene and we must do that too to get the facts about the cause of Christ in Murray. That's number one. Here's number two. Grieve the facts about the cause of Christ. When we see decline all around us, when we see Christ being disregarded as he is by the vast majority, and when we see church after church facing death, imminent closure, here's a question, what should we do? Now, our minds perhaps jump ahead at this stage. Maybe we think, oh, we need more church planting, or we need more church revitalization, or we need better strategic planning or, or more evangelism. Now, all those things are good, and both Nehemiah and we will get to them. But to jump to any of that would be to miss something important, something godly. Nehemiah jumps immediately to none of those things. Instead, look what he does. Verse 4, when I heard these things... I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I'm not sure how many sermons you've heard that made you want to weep, maybe for the right or the wrong reasons. And I might not say this very often, but one key takeaway from this week's sermon, one of our key responses should be to sit down and weep. Nehemiah weeps over a city he's never even been to because he sees the seriousness of the situation and he cares. God's people are demoralized and in disarray. God's name is being dishonored among the nations. The city of God lies in ruins. For the people of God there is trouble and disgrace. And because Nehemiah loves God and he loves God's people, he sits down and weeps and mourns and fasts. And it seems to me it wouldn't be too strong to say that we've reached a place in our nation when the people of God are in trouble and disgrace as well, and, and that the metaphorical walls, at least, of the church are broken down. And far from being honored, God's name is not even known by the vast majority around us. People all around us know nothing of the saving news of Jesus Christ. As a result, they are heading to a lost eternity in hell. 
And to make it worse, in many places, the church has become so weakened that there is little evangelistic witness left. Very few Christians left who might be willing or able to share the gospel with them. And to further exacerbate the problem, some churches have even abandoned believing this gospel at all. As an aside, you might ask, how have we got here? It's pretty clear how that the nation of Israel got into this state of decline in Nehemiah's day, but what about us today? Well, it seems to me there are at least two answers. They both have to do with abandoning the Bible as the word of God here. And I'm talking, by the way, not about things happening out in the world, the secularization that have caused decline. That's true as well. I'm talking about things within the church that we have done to bring about our own decline. Two attitudes then. Here they are. Liberalism and lip service. Liberalism simply stops believing the word of God. When scripture says Jesus is the only way to salvation, or that judgment is real, or that sin is serious, liberalism simply doesn't believe these things. It takes its lead not from the Bible, but from the culture. For example, since its last General Assembly back in May, The Church of Scotland is now a denomination which formally endorses things which the Bible explicitly condemns. You may know I'm talking about same-sex marriage, but that is not the only example. In fact, that issue is just a symptom of a deeper issue. Again and again, liberalizing churches say, oh, if we just become a bit more like the secular culture, then people will come back to church. And again and again, they are wrong. As we see now in the massive number of closures, God does not honor churches who abandon his word in liberalism. But look, there's another way to abandon God's word. Not through liberalism this time, but through lip service. And maybe this is the one that's closer to home for us. We teach the Bible as God's word. We say that we believe it. But do we fail to actually live it? I'm speaking to you and to myself here. That's all sorts of examples we could give, but since we're talking about mission, here's one. When Jesus commands us, Matthew 28, verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Do we do it? Do we have a a passion and a commitment to making Jesus known, as it says behind me? to people all around us? Are we, in effect, denying the authority of the Bible? Not so much through liberalism. It's easy to point fingers at other people, isn't it? What about our own hearts? We might not be in liberalism, but are we just in lip service? And so when we grieve that the state of the church in Scotland, when we take a moment to reflect on the decline around us, We must not just mourn what others have done or failed to do. The problem is not just out there, but in here. It's in me. It's in you. So we need to get the facts. We need to grieve the facts. And then lastly today, give ourselves to prayer for the cause of Christ in Murray. Let's read on now. And by the way, this chapter in Nehemiah, I don't think it's hard to understand. Um, It's not the understanding, but but the doing of it that challenges us. Anyway, read on from verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive 
and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Now look, again, if you're like me anyway, when you hear this stuff, you want to jump into action. And we must do that. Believe me, Nehemiah is a man of action. But before any of that, this is crucial, he's a man of prayer. If we are going to see change, if we are going to see ongoing church revitalization here and in Elgin and church planting elsewhere, if we are going to fulfill our mission to know Jesus, to make him known, to the glory of his name, if we're going to realize that huge vision to grow, to become three vibrant all-age churches of 100 disciples, we've got to start on our knees. Notice, first of all, that Nehemiah's prayer is, is first of all, maybe surprisingly, it's a prayer of praise. Verse 5 again. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. It's a prayer of praise, and it gives you a window into what Nehemiah believes about God. He believes God is glorious and awesome and powerful. So what about us? Do we believe the same? When you hear a vision for growth to, to, to much bigger numbers than we are now, against a background of decline, when you hear a vision for revitalization in Elgin from a low ebb and for the planting of another church, when you hear this vision, which will involve dozens, if not hundreds of people, coming to faith in Christ for the first time, or when you hear, as you will in a couple of weeks, about, or on Wednesday, if you come for a bonus, about our plans to renovate, indeed to extend our church halls, to resource some of this ministry, and frankly, when you hear what it's going to cost, when you hear, for example, about the funding gap that still exists for Brian and Cheryl Roby, who are in the States trying to raise funds to come and work with us as missionaries here in this whole project in Murray. When you hear about all these, these aspects of our vision, which frankly in human terms feel impossible, do we believe God can do it? Like Nehemiah, do we believe that God is the great and awesome God? Do we believe he's the God, as Psalm 50 says, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Resources aren't actually a problem for him. Do you believe he can work miracles? Because that is what it will take. So it's a prayer of praise. Secondly, it's a prayer for pardon. Look there, midway through verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Just like we saw in our section on grief, the causes of church decline are not just out there. They're not just in other places or in other people. It's not just the forces of liberalism or secularization, although that's true. The bigger truth is that sin lives closer to home in us, in me. And Nehemiah is prepared to say that and to, to intercede, to, to confess his sin and the sin of his people. And so the question comes to me and to you. Will we repent of our unbelief? Will we repent of, of the small view of God we've had? Or of our lack of holiness, of our dabbling with sin that we know is wrong? Will we repent of the ways that we've, we've just paid lip service only to the word of God? Will, will we repent because the problems that bring church decline are not just out there, but in here as well? 
Next, Nehemiah's prayer is a prayer that claims God's promises. Verse 8 now. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me to obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. That is a promise that the Lord made many times to his people. Because of his faithfulness to his covenant promises. That even though the people would go into exile, if and when they returned to him, he would be gracious and rescue them from judgment. And Nehemiah, I mean, God doesn't need reminding, but he reminds God of that promise. We might say he claims that promise before God. He prays it back to the Lord, asking him to keep his word. Now, look, we need to be careful here. We are not Nehemiah. We don't live in Nehemiah's day. And so that promise is not made directly to us in the same way that it was to Nehemiah. We can't just grab it and apply it to ourselves in a simplistic way. So here's another question. What, what word, what promise has God given to us today? Again, there are all sorts of places we could go, but again, since we're talking about mission, what about this again? Jesus came to the disciples and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The word of God, which is given to every disciple in every generation since the time of Christ, is this. Disciples of Jesus are to go and make more disciples. So pursuing church health and church growth, pursuing church planting, church revitalization. These are not peripheral side projects for the keen and interested. This is the task that we have been given, and did you notice it comes with a promise? As we do these things, the Lord Jesus himself is with us and for us. As we go about our mission to make him known. In fact, do you know what? That's not quite the right way to put it. It's not our mission at all. This task of making disciples through church revitalization and planting, church health, church growth, it's not actually our mission. This is actually God's mission. He has graciously invited us into it and commanded us to be a part of it. And God is with us in this task and that's not a small thing why well because of verse 18 do you see the one who is with us and for us in this task is the same one who has all authority in heaven and on earth which is a short way of saying everywhere And again, as we think about our vision to grow to be three vibrant all-age churches, you're going to get sick of me saying it, across three locations here in Murray, when we see how many hundreds of thousands the renovations of our halls will cost, when we come face to face with how impossible all of this feels, again, we'll face the question, do we believe That the same God who has all power and all authority is with us and for us in this task. Which of course makes the impossible possible. Finally now, and I promise very briefly, Nehemiah's prayer becomes a prayer of petition. He starts to ask this powerful God not just to hear him, but to listen to him and to intervene in this situation. Verse 10 now. They are your servants and your people 
whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayers of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him, he's talking about himself, favor in the presence of this man. Which man? Well, I was cupbearer to the king. Now, I won't say any more about that today because that's where we're going to pick up next week when Nehemiah begins to move from prayer to action, when he begins to look and see the gospel opportunities he has because of the place in which God has put him. And we've got to do the same, but I'm already starting next week's sermon, so no more for now. For now, will you see the ways we need to respond on the back of your blue sheet there? Like Nehemiah, we need to get the facts about the cause of Christ in our location. We've seen much of it from the grim picture of statistics. Will you help us to know even more? Will you help us to kickstart that process of revitalization in Elgin by signing up to do some door knocking with us in Elgin as we try to get lots of responses to that survey? But then like Nehemiah, we need to grieve and we need to pray. We've got to think seriously about the state of the church in Scotland and here in Murray. We must not bury our heads in the sand as perhaps we are tempted to do. Instead, we've got to grieve. Instead, we've got to pray. And there are many opportunities in the life of our church to pray Again, I sound like a broken record, but I think in every church I've belonged to, prayer meetings remain the most poorly attended meetings in church life. So will you join us and pray? Pray on your own. Pray in your family. Pray at our prayer cafe on alternate Wednesdays. Pray in your small groups. Join us to pray at our Monday morning mission and vision meeting on Zoom. Wherever you are, pray. And we're going to do that now. Let's pray, shall we, together. As we often do, let's take a moment of quiet reflection as we think, as we grieve, as we come to God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have come to us in grace and in love. And that in Jesus you have won our forgiveness, bought at the cross. Lord, thank you that you have called us to be your children and drawn us into your family and sent us out on your mission. Father, as we look at the church around us and as we look at our own hearts, Lord, we grieve and mourn for all that has been lost. Father, forgive us when through a liberalism or lip service we have ignored you and not heeded your word. Lord, forgive us when we've been prayerless. Help us to pray and to trust in you, the God of all power and might. Thank you that you are with us and for us in this, your mission. And as we journey on, thinking of our vision and through the book of Nehemiah, Father, meet us, we pray, speak to us, transform our hearts and our church. Lord, if it is your will, in your grace, we pray that we might indeed grow to be at least three vibrant all-age churches of a hundred disciples. Lord, we bring our visions and our dreams and our plans to you, knowing that you alone are sovereign. You alone are the God of all power and might. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to end in song on the back of your sheet. Uh, here is a call to war. 
but it is the war of the gospel, which is a war of love to bring news of grace to those around us. If you're able, again, let's stand as we sing. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belts of truth, we'll stand against the devil. Battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded old, we will fight with faith and valor When faced with trials on every side We know the outcome is secure And we will have the price for which He died An inheritance of nations See the cross where love and mercy meet As the Son of God is stricken Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet As the conqueror has risen And as the stone is rolled away Strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. The saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of His grace. Their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we'll stand in glory. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Please do sit, folks. Thanks again for being with us. Um, just a reminder, I will stick out the sign-up sheet to get involved with Elgin Survey at the back in just a moment. And um, please do stick around. Uh, Gene and Phil would be glad to serve you a tea or a coffee at the back. And if you did bring children, we do ask that you take them home as well.